I'm Dale Reed from the University of Illinois in Chicago, UIC, and I'm here to talk about secret codes and ice cream and about some problems that computers have trouble solving. I'd like to start by telling you a story. When I was in elementary school, I had a crush on a girl, and uh, I wasn't particularly brave, so I sent her a note. I said, do you like me? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't cool back then to say, do you love me? So, do you like me? And I sent it off to her. Of course, I didn't put my name on it. I figured if she really did like me and knew who I was, that she'd send the right person the note back. I did get the note back, but it's always nervous passing these notes in class because if the teacher got one of these notes, intercepted one of these notes, she would read the note out loud in class to everybody. So once we started exchanging note, uh, notes, we, we devised an approach to send the notes so if someone intercepted it, that they wouldn't be able to really easily and quickly uh, decipher what the note was. And that was we would substitute one letter for another. So instead of A, we'd put B. Instead of B, we'd put C like that. Just shift by one letter. So that way, if the teacher intercepted it, she couldn't readily read it. So this is called the Caesar cipher. It turns out that, that we were not the first ones to think of this, uh, that back in the days of Caesar, of Caesar that uh, this is what they used for military communication. They actually shifted the letters. They transposed them. So let's say that this is the original alphabet right here. And let's say we wanted to send the message, hello, H-E-L-L-O. So we have the H, we have the E, I've highlighted them in bold right here so we can, we can track them more easily. And let's say we wanted to do the, the plus one, we wanted to add one to it, or if we wanted to do minus one is another thing we could do. So here, if I took H and I wanted to do minus, how about let's say we're being tricky, and I wanted to do minus two, so minus one from H would go back to G, and minus 1 again would go from G back to F. So if I'm doing minus 2, it would go from H to F. And just to aid us, I've shifted the whole alphabet over here. So we can just look at the letters directly under it for minus 1, and then the one uh, below that for minus 2. So we can see that H becomes F, E becomes C, and so on. And hello becomes F, C, J, J, M. I can't really pronounce it. So you can think about what happens at the ends of the alphabet. And uh, if you want, you could pause the video right now and try and decipher what would TFDSFU be. And I'm not necessarily telling you if it's plus one, minus one, or what it is. Can you figure that out? So I'll give you a moment to do that. All right, welcome back. You either solved it and came back or tried it. In any case, um, that I'll leave that as a discovery for you. Let's think of a different kind of communication where we're worried about the person in the middle intercepting. And this is our pathway to figure out a way to, to securely do this. So let's say that Pat and Jordan and Nanda uh, are together and but uh, in the same place, but, but Pat wants to send a box of candy to Nanda but has to pass it through Jordan. So the problem is if Pat just passes the box of, of candy, then Jordan's gonna get it and open it up and eat some of that candy and it's not gonna to get to Nanda. So how are we gonna do this? There's a container, a secure, let's say unbreakable container, and Pat has a key and a lock, and Nanda also has a key and a lock, and these keys, these are, are not the same, they're different from each other. So then Pat, um, how would Pat get this candy and, and securely be able to pass it to Nanda without Jordan in the middle who handles it every time being having access to the candy. Again, let me encourage you to consider pausing the video for a moment, thinking about how this problem might be solved. All right, welcome back. One way this could happen would be as follows. First of all, Pat puts the lock on, and, and there's space for two locks on there. Um, if one or both are on there, Jordan can't open the box. So Pat locks with Pat's lock and passes the candy across. Jordan sees it, but can't get into it because the lock's there. Nanda gets it. Nanda can't get into it either because it's locked with Pat's lock, and Nanda's key is different from Pat's key. Well, then Nanda takes and puts Nanda's lock on it, and sends it back. Jordan gets it, now there's two locks on it. Even worse, can't get to the candy inside. Pat then receives it, and once Pat receives it, Pat takes Pat's lock off, 
but it still has Nanda's lock on it and sends it back through. Jordan still can't get at it because Nanda's lock is on there. And then once Nanda gets it, then Nanda can take Nanda's lock off and open the candy box and successfully pass the candy across the line here from Pat to Nanda and the person in the middle, Jordan, can't access the candy, can't get it. So this same idea, we're going to do this with the text transposition thing that we talked about earlier with Caesar cipher as an example. So let's say that, and, and Caesar cipher is considered a relatively weak cipher because if you're shifting just by one letter, well, you could maybe be able to figure that out. But it's going to help us here to understand how we can, how we have these two locks and keys and how they work together. So let's say that we have the original message and let's say we're going to send the letters S-E-C-R-E-T, secret from Pat to Nanda. So we start out and highlight these letters. So we have S right there, S-E-C-R, another E, and T, highlighted them in bold. So secret. So let's say that Pat, um, the shift for Pat is going to be plus two. So the S for secret would go plus one would be T, plus another would be U. Let's see, S, oh, here's a secret, but plus one would be T, yeah. And then plus two, that's right, would be U. So I've, again, for convenience, just listed these and shifted by one so we can see S plus one would be T, T plus one would be U, and uh, we can just follow the letters that are up above, and I've highlighted them in yellow. So secret, those letters become U, G, E, T, G, V. So the S becomes the U, the E becomes the G, and so forth. So secret plus two ends up being U, get, gev. So it's now locked with Pat's key, if you will. And Pat sends U, get, gev across the line. Not uh, Jordan gets it in the middle and it's like, oh, what's this? That doesn't make sense. And then we go on to the next step. Now, Nanda's key is minus four. So Nanda receives you get gev, doesn't know what Pat's key is. So Nanda gets you get gev. And then Nanda's key is minus four. So here's Nanda's. So we have, uh, so you get gev is represented up here on the top, top row. Minus four, we go down four levels. And now um, the U becomes Q and the G becomes C and so forth. So those letters become now you get gev minus four becomes Q C A P C R Q cap car. So now it's locked with both keys with the minus two with the plus two and the minus four. So Nanda sends back to Pat Q cap car across the line. Well, now Pat receives that, and that doesn't make sense to Pat. Pat doesn't you know understand what that is necessarily here. Well, be able to figure it out because. It's an easy code to break. but So then Pat removes Pat's original keys. Now, Pat originally did a plus two. So if Pat's going to remove the plus two, Pat's going to do a minus two. So Pat takes the Q capcur that came from Nanda right here and does the minus two, removing Pat's plus two key. And so we have here Q capcur, so this Q. And so we're doing a minus two, minus two then, um, Q to the left twice becomes O, and for convenience, I've just lined them up here. So Q becomes O, and C becomes A, and so forth. So Q capcur minus 2 becomes OINEP. And now uh, Pat sends OINEP back to Nanda. So now this is, Pat has removed Pat's uh, lock on there. And now Nanda receives this message, and it's only locked with Nanda's. So when Nanda gets this, Nanda's, remember, uh, original minus 4 key means if we want to remove the minus 4, we have to reverse it into a plus 4. So Nanda receives OINAP, and so we take OINAP and we do a plus 4. So here's the O, plus 4, would be 1, 2, 3, 4, up here to S. And for convenience, we can just go up here, S, and O, and then A, becomes an E, so C correct, and it's decoded, and here's the original message. So it got same idea as the candy, but now we're doing the shifting of letters to do it. Uh, the problem here, though, is so Jordan at no point at Jordan can't read the message at any point because the message, when it's going across the middle, is always encrypted um, somehow. Problem with this is just shifting by a letter. Like, well, that's just not really very safe. 
So we have to come up with a better way to represent a letter besides just shifting it where it's truly hidden in a much better way. So we're going to take a side trip to Ice Cream Town. So here's Ice Cream Town. So when you look at this drawing right here, the, the dots, the black dots represent intersections like a map of the town. And the green lines represents the streets connecting the intersections. So it's a graph, but we're pretending it's a map of a town. Now in Ice Cream Town, it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you like ice cream. I like ice cream. Briar's Vanilla, I think, is probably my favorite. Well, in Ice Cream Town, the people of the town, boy, do they love their ice cream. Not only do they love it, but they have actually gotten addicted to it. So if they don't get their ice cream, that's a big problem. They go through ice cream withdrawal. They can't function. They can't um, do the things they would normally do. In fact, just last week, in the middle of the night, in the Jones family, the, uh, the parents woke up. First the dad, then the mom wanting ice cream went out. There's none in the freezer. Went down the street. <clears throat> the convenience store was closed. They were stumbling around. They were found by emergency personnel, and it almost caused a problem for their family uh, in terms of getting breakfast for the kids. So the, uh, the city council got together and said, you know what, we need to do something about this. This is happening way too often. What if we put an ice cream truck at every intersection? So we could put one right there, we could put one right there, we could put one right here, and so forth. We could put all those there. And that way, in the middle of the night, if anybody wakes up, they can make it a block. All right, people can walk a block and the ice cream truck will be there and we're going to avoid lots of these problems. Well, and someone said, you know what? I, I think we could do it with fewer ice cream trucks because if we put an ice cream truck, let's say right there, then we, we don't need to put one right here. We could wait and put it like every other one. We could put it like right there instead. And then if one's there and one's there, then, then we don't need to put one right there. Maybe the next one would go like, see, maybe there. So let's see. These people could walk there. These people, oh, so we have a maybe a problem here. These people, um, so every other one. These people could walk that way. These people walk that way. But these people, we have, we have a little bit of a problem there. So maybe we could put one there and put this one here. So when we start playing. So I would encourage you now to think, what's the minimum number of ice cream trucks? I've started out giving you 12 here. What's the minimum number of ice cream trucks you could use to cover this graph um, so that in the middle of the night, if somebody wakes up, they have to walk at most the block. So if I put one there, then it would not need one there, but I could put one there instead, like that, like every other one. To help you out, if you want to drag and drop these little trucks like I have here, if you want to access, there's a, uh, a copy of this. It's a Google Doc, bit.ly slash ice cream code. If you type that into your browser, it'll take you to a page, ask you if you want to make a copy of this document and say yes. And then you'll have these trucks that you can drag and experiment. The other thing that you can do, if you would like, is you could just print this out uh, or do a screenshot of it and play with it uh, and see if you can solve it. So take a moment to see if you can solve this and try and see is this easy? Is it hard? Is there a trick to solving it? Uh, and experiment a little bit before we go on. All right, well, welcome back. I hope I'm not spoiling things too much for you if I tell you that the answer is, is, wait for it, drum roll. Okay, I'll just tell you. It's six. You can do it with six trucks. And those six are these six that are given right here. So how would you make a puzzle like this? Actually, making it's pretty easy. Let's say you start with six, these red ones as shown up here on the top. And we start with those six, and then from each of them, we make some little legs going off and put dots at the end of them and not connecting them to each other. So notice that all of the dots are connected to these original six. So they themselves, plus all the other ones, are all connected to these six. So these six, in a sense, know all of the dots on the graph. 
Then what we do is we take these little legs and connect these legs to the ends of other little legs off there, not connecting them to any of the red original nodes. And, uh, and we end up with this graph that's shown down below here. So then the problem is, if you're given this, but you're not told what six they are, and you're asked to solve it as you just experienced, even though making it can take hardly any time at all, solving it could be quite consuming, particularly if we make a much larger graph. So now back to the issue of sending a secret message. If we want to send a secret message, how can we encode a letter using this approach? Well, first of all, let's think uh, there's something called a ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII, that right there. You don't have to remember that. Um, that's a code for representing uh, alphabetic letters. So if we look at this big chart, capital A corresponds to the value 65. So 65, if we can send 65, and both sides, both sides know that we're using ASCII to represent characters, and we get 65, then that would be capital A. So 65 is what we want to transmit. So we take 65, and we're going to sort of sprinkle values around the graph to, um, to send the 65. So the blue numbers on the graph all add up to 65. So there's a 2 there, a 3, a 2, a 5, a 1, and all those blue numbers, they add up to 65. So once the blue numbers are on there, then we do a little bit more computation to get the yellow numbers. The yellow numbers represent all the ones that are reachable from a particular node. So if we look at this node right here, that node um, is reached from this one. There's the blue 2. So in purple, I wrote the blue 2 right there. And here is a 2. And so there's that 2. And then down here is the 3. So that 3 comes in. And then here's a 2 from down here coming up. And then the 2 here itself. So I have 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2. And this, and, and this one as well, right? It gives us 11. 10, 11. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then we do that for all of them. And then we take, we leave just the yellow numbers and we take the blue numbers away. And now to find what those blue numbers are would be much harder because if I have a nine here, I don't know which one contributed how much for these. So <coughs> to identify the original set of those six nodes, we have to solve the puzzle. To, to get that. So there aren't any quick shortcuts to finding it once we get to this point. This is an example of a one-way function, easy to do in one direction, but very hard to do the other. So then how do we, how does it work? How do, how do we transmit the letter um, using this? So given this graph, if we send it, if the person, if the person knows what, what those six are, these six the yellow numbers represents the sum of all the reachable nodes from those. And so if I take that 9 plus the 12 plus the 10, 12, 12, and 10, if I add those up, they represent the entire graph. And those numbers added up equals 65, which is our capital A. So for Pat and Nanda to communicate securely, each would create their own graph. They would publish the graph itself, the structure of it, what's connected to what, publicly. But what they would keep secret is what are those special, in this case, six nodes that are the covering set that represent the entire graph, which would be required to be able to quickly uh, decipher what the letter is that's being transmitted using that graph. So this, again, is an example of a one-way function. It's easy to create, hard to solve. Um, so a graph with 27 nodes, like we saw there, um, either does have or doesn't have a truck at each intersection. So that gives you 2 to the 27th equals big number of possibilities to try in an exhaustive search. So if each configuration takes a second to check before in a quarter years, which is a long time, now you'd say, oh, but computers are much faster than that. But we can also make graphs that are much bigger than that. So it ends up being um, inconvenient or not in a reasonable amount of time that the computer could figure out something like this. In the real world, one of the um, things of a, a, a function that is one-way functions that easy to do, easy to create, but hard to solve, are done mathematically in encryption, and is finding prime numbers, prime factors of large numbers. So let's think about 35. So 35 is 5 times 7. So 5 and 7 are both prime numbers. They're divisible by 1 in themselves, 
but not by anything else. So 5 and 7 are both prime, and 5 times 7 is 35. So prime factorization, I, you're probably familiar with this. So let's think about 91. What's a prime factorization? I see it's not 2. 2 times, no, it's going to be even, right? So we think about that and go, okay, so we come 7 times 13, we can figure out prime factors of 91. We have to think about it for a little bit. But as numbers get bigger, it gets harder. So if you want to challenge yourself, you could pause right now and figure out 209 and 551. Otherwise, I'll just give it away. Give me a second to pause. All right, moving on. 209, 11 times 19. 551, 29 times 19. So if you've got some prime numbers, multiplying them together to get this bigger one, that's pretty fast, but it's a lot slower to take this bigger number and then try and come up with the primes that are the prime factors of that number. So if those are like really easy for you, then here's the challenge question for extra credit. There we go. This 100-digit number, what are the prime factors of that 100-digit number? And then you're like, okay, yes, that would take a long time. No, I don't want to do that by hand. Even if I'm very well paid, I would not want to have a pen and a stack of paper and have that be my job. Well, as it turns out, those are that times that. There we go. Those are the prime factors. So if you get a tables of some really big prime numbers, then you can just chew two of them at random and end up with some other bigger one. And then if you use that somehow in your transmission um, and someone has to do the prime factorization before they can break your code, then that would be expensive in terms of time. So why does all this matter? Well, encryption relies on one-way functions. They're easy to create, hard to solve, and even fast computers can't break strong encryption in a reasonable amount of time. And it's used for secrecy and authentication and secure online communication in buying and selling bank tra transactions, things like that, which happens all the time nowadays. Leave you with a challenge puzzle. So encryption involves some information that you share publicly, the public part, and some that you keep private to yourself. So think about this problem. Imagine that you work, you have a job, and you're paid by the hour, and you're working, uh, you have a meeting with your boss to discuss your salary, you'd like to ask for a raise, but only if you currently make less than the average of your coworkers. If you ask for a raise and you're getting paid less than them, you'll probably get the raise. But if you ask for a raise and you're getting paid more than them, you might get fired. You don't want to do that. So you're at lunch with everybody and you want to find out what everyone's average is, but nobody really trusts anybody else. So how could you find the average of everyone's salary without anyone having to divulge what their actual salary is? So assume you have paper and pencils people could use. Assume everybody's hourly salary is less than $20 an hour. And let's say, assume that one person has very unmistakable, distinct handwriting. So you can't just say, everybody try and disguise your writing and put it on a paper and put it in the middle that you're going to be able to tell. So that's not going to work. How might you do this? Let me encourage you to post a reply to this video with your solution. And there could be various solutions that people come up with. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I encourage you to check out the other videos in this series, series that the College Board has put out. Thank you very much.